Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. Hey, listener, it's Dan here. If you like On the Tape, you're going to love Risk Reversal Media's latest podcast called OK Computer. That's O-K-A-Y Computer. I co-host it with a murderer's row of tech investors, both public and private markets. We're going to discuss the intersection of Web 2 and Web 3 and how we are putting our money to work in those markets here. So check it out. It drops every Wednesday. Follow it in the podcast store and follow us on Twitter at OK Computer Pod. Typically, we would come in all hot and excited and bothered, but the world's obviously changed. And this week, we're without our good friend Danny Moses, who is in parts unknown, as they say. I think he's at a bachelor party or something in one of the islands, Dan. But he picked a great week to be away because so many things have happened, both geopolitically, market-wise. It's all over the map, Dan. And it's amazing that we're here together on a Thursday afternoon. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You have these periods in the markets where during the pandemic, it was clearly across multiple risk assets. There was currencies, there was commodities, there were stocks, there were yields. Everything was moving. And those are really difficult markets. And I know, Guy, you've been a market pundit for a very long time. And you also traded a lot of those products. And so one of the things that we try to do is make some sense of it without making it too wonky or too difficult in a way. And so we had gone after the pandemic, it was just a rip roaring stock market. You had low yields, you had low volatility, you had a lot of liquidity, and it was just buy every dip in the equity market. And these are the periods that are really hard. I've been spending a lot of time, as you have, talking about what's been going on over the last few weeks or a few months or so. You and I have been doing a lot of Twitter spaces, doing a lot of content, and it seems like there's just an explosion of people who don't know what the fuck is going on right now. So at the end of the day, days like today don't really help so much, guy, because it doesn't make any sense. We opened down, what, 3% in the NASDAQ, 2.5% in the S&P 500. And here we are as we go into the close. It looks like a rip roaring day, like all's good in the world. In case you were confused, you are listening on the tape. I'm oh, yeah. Guy Adami, joined always by Dan Nathan. As I mentioned, Danny's on vacation. But Dan, you mentioned some of these rip roaring moves. You wrote them down because the reversals we've seen today, today being Thursday, by the way, folks, have been nothing short of historic. Listen, you and I keep an eye on a few things like this in markets like this, in fast markets like this, where it's just not about the stock market. The VIX opened, what, at 37 and a half, and that was the dead high, right, guy? And we had crude oil, WTI traded 100. Now it's trading about 92 and a half, 93. The VIX is down at 30. Gold, your gold, guy, trade 1974, the all time high, and you were calling for 2000 gold in 2020, just so you know, and you got it. I think that high was 2074, so we got to 1974, but a huge reversal, right? This was really interesting. We're gonna talk about this a little later. Gold reversed, it's down 5%. Bitcoin was down 5% this morning. And that rip, that reverse correlation is really interesting. And there was definitely some crazy sector moves. We've definitely seen some rotations. What are some of the rotations that are really sticking out to you? Obviously, tech is just ripping, beating up tech in particular. No question about it. And I guess the one thing that stands out to me is exactly that, tech. And we'll try to sort of unravel this for you folks and try to make sense of it all in terms of what I think's going on. Yields obviously went significantly higher over the last couple of weeks. You saw 10-year yields trade north of, I think, 2.04%, highest we've seen in quite some time. But one of the things that we thought collectively here on On The Tape was if the broader market were to sell off, you would see a flight to quality in the form of bonds pushing bond yields lower. Counterintuitively, that would mean that some of these stocks that are hinged upon interest rates could start to do better. And in microcosm, Dan, that's exactly what we saw here today. And a number of these high-flying, high-growth, high-valuation tech names that have been taken out to the woodshed over the last six months. I'm not suggesting this is over by any stretch of imagination. Many more chapters will be written. But today, at least, you'll see what can happen to things when the world starts to unravel a bit. 
Well, I think the point that you're making here is so if you're looking at this high valuation tech where many of these names that are in the NASDAQ are down 50, 60, 70% or so, and these are real companies. Like here's a good example. PayPal traded $310 in July. And I know we bring this one up a lot because it had a market cap greater than Bank America at the time and traded below $100 today or is still below $100 or so. And you think of that, this is still a $100 billion market cap company, which is kind of insane. So, Guy, we were talking earlier about this IGV. This is the iShares software ETF. I mean, the reversal on this thing, I think it traded as low as... 306 and a half and it's trading what at 333 right now that's just today from the opening here and this is down by the way the igv v is in victory which by the way was a great movie with sylvester stallone oh yeah and pele yeah if you recall i mean that was a 448 dollar item in november traded as low today as you mentioned 305 and change or so which by the way is the lows we saw i want to say back in the fall of 2020 The move is astounding. I mean, that's an unprecedented move. And what are the components, you ask? Well, I'll tell you, because it's not equal weighted. Microsoft is about 9.5%. Then you have Salesforce, Adobe, Intuit, Oracle, and ServiceNow, all anywhere from 5.5% to 7%. And the bounce is, again, unbelievable. But that's what you're going to see in these types of markets. And not to make people's eyes glaze over, Dan, but you did a show on CNBC called Options Action for Years, (laughs) And when volatility gets to these levels, you see moves like this. You see exaggerated moves to the downside. And in the course of a few hours, you see the same moves to the upside. And that's people chasing their tails in the form of something we used to call bad Greek or negative gamma. Yeah, but long before I was ever on options action guy and really not even trading options back in the day, I go back to these protracted bear markets that we had after the dot-com bubble busted in 2001, 2002. This sort of price action was emblematic of those sorts of markets. I just tweeted this out, but the NASDAQ sold off nearly 80% from its highs in the spring of 2000 to its lows in October of 2002. And go look at those charts. Go look at 01 and 02. It was one step forward, two steps back. And that one step forward, they were usually violent, like what we're seeing in the price action today. And I will tell you, I was not in the markets for that long at that point. I started in 1997. So I was like a BTFD sort of kid in the late 90s. And then I was a sell the rip sort of person. And I still have scar tissue from that period from 01 and 02, because you play for a little bounce, but you knew that they were going to go and make new lows and valuation didn't matter. Catalyst didn't matter. Product announcements didn't matter. The thing that I worry about is that guy, the bloodletting that we saw in tech IPOs, unprofitable tech companies and SPACs, even in some of the crypto related stuff over the last year that have been happening before the broad indices went lower is very emblematic of that dot com bust. And some of the price action that we've seen over the last six to nine months is really similar to me. It's amazing. And just to throw one more thing, because in terms of the broader market, the S&P today, again, being Thursday, traded as low as 41.14. You had a 140-point swing just in the S&P. Again, moves that you normally wouldn't see. Now, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people saying that was the bottom. And I guarantee you, you'll hear a lot of people saying how they bought the lows today and how they've been selling the hot tops. That's not particularly interesting. What I'll say to your point, Dan, is I still think, until I'm proven wrong, that the paradigm shift is here. It started in November. We've gone from a buy the sell-off market to a sell the rally market, and I think we're in that now. Now, that'll play out over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, many chapters left to be written in this Russia-Ukraine thing, but one of the situations we've talked about for a while that I do think will rear its head at some point is what's going on with potentially China and Taiwan. So although the market seems to have found its footing, I don't think the world has at all. Yeah, and I think the issue you bring up there, if there was another geopolitical dust-up, and there's no easy answer to what's going on with Ukraine. I was listening to CNBC earlier this morning, and I think Kramer was suggesting that maybe you have a scenario where there's a new leader put in place in Ukraine. And I couldn't think of a worse possible scenario. And he was highlighting the fact that that might be terms for de-escalation. And I just don't see that happening. I don't see it happening very quickly. I don't see it happening smoothly. I don't think it's something that the global community will feel good about. And the economic sanctions will only get more dramatic in a way. So to me, I don't really see too many good outcomes right here, Guy. And the other one, 
one I'll just say is that you've been calling for the potential, at least, that the Chinese do something with Taiwan after the Olympics. Can you imagine if the Fed is focused on fighting inflation, and they clearly are right now? Normally, the playbook, if you had some sort of dust up geopolitically, that they would get more dovish and they'd provide easy monetary policy and get through it so there's no credit seizing up and the like. Well, it's interesting that the worst performing group in the S&P 500 today are the banks. I don't know if you noticed that Citigroup at one point was down 7%. Deutsche Bank is down about 10%. Maybe there's some fears of default risk or just generally some of the issues as it relates to economic sanctions and what banks have exposures. That's pretty interesting to me. But the other issue issue is inflation. So we already know that the situation with Russia and Ukraine is causing energy prices to spike. So energy inflation is a problem. And if the Fed is trying to battle that, then they can't ease. And if there's a situation in China with Taiwan, then you have further disruption to supply chains. So then you think about Well, then we actually have to onshore more stuff. So you have wage inflation sticking, you have shipping costs sticking. And the other one is that China imports a lot of food. And so if we have sanctions against China, then you have a situation with food prices. So all of a sudden, the Fed actually has no tools. You tell me, Guy, what tools do the Fed have to deal with this sort of inflationary pressures? None whatsoever. And it's interesting you bring that up because you will hear, Dan, a lot of voices say what's going on now with Russia and Ukraine and potentially China and Taiwan will give the Fed air cover to not be as aggressive as they've stated they will be. And I would submit that's entirely wrong. As a matter of fact, you're looking at it through the entire wrong lens. If peace were to suddenly break out, the inflation that they're trying to combat would still be there. If this continues on its way, the path that we're going down now between Russia and Ukraine and obviously potentially between China and Taiwan inflation's only going to get worse. So what they're trying to combat is bad under any set of circumstances. And for those of you out there think that somehow this Russia-Ukraine is for Vladimir Putin to get back the Russian empire, something that he talks about, yeah, that's part of it, and I get it, and he wants to go down in history books. But keep this in mind. Ukraine is either the fourth or fifth largest commodity nation on the planet. And if you control commodities in this world, you control the global economy. China controls it on one side of the world, and I'm about to believe that Russia can control it on the other. And if you look what's going on, as again, we talk about energy prices, but natural gas prices. Look what's going on in the soft commodities, not to make your eyes glaze over, but wheat Glazed. has been on a rocket ship to the upside. <laughs> Soybeans, corn, all those different things. And to me, that's really what's going on. So they can mask it under the unification. But in reality, this is to try to control global economies. And I guess the point is, is that we had that rip-roaring growth. We had all that monetary, all that fiscal stimulus. And I think a lot of economists, a lot of strategists expected us to be out of the pandemic by now and get some sort of inflection point as it relates to global growth. And 2021 got disrupted by two variants of the virus. You keep hearing people say we are in the endemic, but think about the pandemic that we have of just state-sponsored violence right now. You say this all the time, Guy, and I've been doing Fast Money with you, I think, for 11 years or so, and you and I have been doing this stuff on Market Call and on the tape and all this stuff for the last year and a half or so, and there really haven't been, other than the pandemic, too many geopolitical things. But you often say, and especially you said a lot during the pandemic, but in times prior where there was dust-ups with Russia, and you say this all the time, from a humanitarian aspect, there's some really serious stuff going on. And here we are, we're talking about stocks, we're talking about bonds, and in the grand scheme of things, not particularly important. So we always want to be sensitive that you always made a great point of that during the pandemic about the humanitarian aspects but what we're here to do is try to focus on your money our money and how we can avoid some pitfalls but i gotta tell you guy as i was thinking about my day this morning i got off the exercise bike and i was thinking about all the content we're going to do and what we're going to say and at the time things were really hairy and the pictures on the news were not great major cities in ukraine being shelled and soldiers occupying things and the markets were going haywire and it was a very somber time and on my radio a song came on and I'm going to read you a lyric all right this is from the great Roger Waters and if the cloud bursts thunder in your ear you shout and no one seems to hear and if the band you're in starts playing different tunes I'll see you on the dark side 
of the moon. Now, if Danny was here, he'd be singing that. But I was thinking about that lyric, and I was like, oh man, isn't that what's going on right now? Think about that, how the Western response is to what's going on in Ukraine. I think it's been pretty weak, to be very frank with you. Think about what the Fed is doing right now. They've been shouting into the ether and not a whole heck of a lot going on. I'm just trying to channel your David Gilmore for me right now and tell me what you think that means. No, I think that's a great lyric, and I'll give you one more. I'll go a little Simon and Garfunkel on you and say a man hears what he wants to oh, hear and disregards, disregards the, the rest. rest. I mean, isn't that the truth? And to a certain point, that's exactly what goes on. So many people are caught up in their echo chambers and they just want to hear what reinforces their belief system, their dogma, what they want to hear, what makes them feel good, and you disregard everything else. And to a certain extent, that's what's going on. There's so much blame now going on against the Biden administration. And I'm not particularly interested in politics. And listen, I will tell you flat out, they haven't handled this one particularly well either. But the seeds were sown for uh, so many of the things that are going on, not only during this administration, but during the last two or three administrations. And if you don't think that's true, you're just not paying attention. I agree with that. I mean, listen, I don't think anyone feels really good about how we're dealing with this right now. And hopefully the loss of life will be minimal. But I think the battle lines that are being drawn or the state lines that are being redrawn are going to have implications, I think, to your point for decades to come. And so we really got to take it seriously. One thing I'll just say to you, Guy, and this is a bit of an aside, when I was thinking about the song Brain Damage, and you heard that last lyric that I read, Dark Side of the Moon. Now, that's the title of the album. So I want to ask you this question. I was thinking about it. How many songs, rock songs that you know of, have the title of the album as a lyric in a song that it's not named? So if that song was named Dark Side of the Moon, it's on the Dark Side of the Moon album, you see that sort of thing. But that's pretty interesting. Can you think of any right there off the top of your head? Clearly, you have something in mind. I will tell you, not that you particularly care, but yeah. along those lines, one of the great Led Zeppelin songs is Over the Hills and Far Away off Houses of the Holy. But over the Hills and Far Away is not mentioned once during the song. And I will tell you, as an aside, that song was actually written as an instrumental and it was only a year or so later that Robert Plant decided to put lyrics down to that. Oh, wow. Okay, fair enough. Bronyar is another one where there are no lyrics. You love that song. I know you do. One thing that stuck out to me on that same topic, though, was the song Walk On. It's on the album All That You Can't Leave Behind from U2. I think it came out in 01. And in that song, they actually say All That You Can't Leave Behind, but the song's called Walk On. All right, let's go back to this whole notion of the Fed painted themselves in a corner. You've been saying this, I think, for a year now. You and I would go back and forth a little bit on what they needed to do or didn't need to do during the throes of the pandemic. And they moved very quickly. They moved Fed funds basically to zero, I think in February of 2020, before Congress got its act together and before we knew what PPP and all the fiscal stuff was going to look like. And I guess your point was you can't prove a counterfactual, what would have happened otherwise. And you've been very clear about your thoughts on all the TARP and all the stuff that went on during the financial financial crisis. My view at the time was they were using the playbook that they have used on the last two crises in the 15 years prior, but they really did it on steroids. And the, this time around, it was because there was just a sort of health crisis that was not easy to map out for all intents and purposes. But your point is, why the hell were they buying $120 billion worth of treasuries and MBS a year afterwards? And now here we are, and they're fighting inflation that they wouldn't acknowledge. And granted, last summer, you heard me, I was trolling you and Danny, and I was saying transitory, 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 and they stuck with that way too long. And now they have to hike into what might be its own pandemic. For all we know, if you think about it from a geopolitical standpoint, we just don't know. And are we going to find ourselves in the first bout of stagflation in 50 years. Certainly feels that way. And I think more and more people are going to start to be talking about that word specifically. And there are no tools in the toolbox or no arrows in their quiver to combat exactly what you're talking about. And look, again, you can't prove the counterfactual. I totally get that. And you've made this point a number of times. The Federal Reserve did what they needed to do at the time. I would agree with that. My biggest problem is the amount of time they stuck around and yeah. their unwillingness to sort of let the markets go on their merry way and figure it out on their own. And you talk about them buying $120 billion worth of stuff. They're still today adding to that balance sheet. Yes, granted at a slower pace, but they're still adding to the balance sheet. We haven't seen that stop at all, which is just makes no sense to me. So the inflation that they wanted 
they created. They have inflation in all the wrong places. And I think if you were to ask them, they would acknowledge that. Real wages in this country, when you take into consideration inflation, which, by the way, real inflation is probably closer to 12 percent. But I'll play the game and I'll say it's seven and a half percent given the last CPI. Real wage growth in this country is minus negative 3.1 percent. Yeah, that's a problem. What does that mean? Well, that's got to catch up. One of two things has to happen, Dan. Either inflation has to come down markedly, which I don't think will happen, or wage growth is going to have to pick up considerably which I do think will happen because at this point, the only way to get people to work is to pay them more. And what does that lead to? Inflation. So to answer your question, they've painted themselves into this box. They think they're smart enough to get out of it. I don't think they are. Yeah. So Danny Moses started talking about stagflation, I think in July and August of 2021 here. And it wasn't even really on the mouths of too many strategists at the time. And we've been kind of exploring what that really means for the stock market, what it means for risk assets in general. And I think it's interesting that high valuation, we talked, you guys know all the stocks that have been selling off for basically the last year and they're down 60 and 70% or something like that. But we've also seen other pockets of risk just take off. We haven't really seen the housing market cool down. We haven't seen seen NFTs while crypto is down 50% floor prices of some of your favorite NFTs. We're going to get to some of those in a little bit have only been rising. So you're still seeing the crowding in certain areas. Obviously there's been inflation hedges, but guy, I just want to talk about the psychology though, what's going on today, because you said, okay, a lot of people are going to be calling for it. It really didn't feel like capitulation today. If you think back to other periods where we've had dislocations across markets, opening down, 3% in the NASDAQ and 2.5% in the S&P 500 and then rallying right off of the lows does not feel like capitulation with the S&P at its lows was down 14.5% and the NASDAQ down 22.5%. You know what's interesting that we didn't talk about? Earlier this week, I think on Tuesday, it was the two-year anniversary of the top of the market for the pandemic. Remember, we were still whistling by the graveyard in late February of 2020 when everything we thought we knew about the pandemic or about this virus and the market sold off 35%. It felt like in a straight line over the next five or six weeks or so. So here we are. The question is, we got a good old-fashioned 10% correction from an all-time high. The NASDAQ really was in bear market territory. They describe that as 20% or so. Is it done? I just don't know. I don't think so. And again, we've talked about if you listen to On the Tape or if you listen to Market Call, if you watch any of those things, we say it all the time. And I know I've said it many, many times. The most vicious, violent rallies take place in bear markets or markets that are trending lower. And we've seen that a number of times specifically over the last couple of months. And we're obviously seeing one today, again, today being Thursday, as you listen to this on the tape on Friday. And I don't think it's over by any stretch of imagination. There are many more chapters left to be written. I think the ebbs and flows in this geopolitical situation are going to continue. But what started all this move to the downside, Dan, months ago, in names we've talked about many times, has not gone away at all. I mean, we will talk about the Russia-Ukraine situation being the reason for the sell-off, and that's part of it. But to me, the seeds were sown for this sell-off when the Fed reversed course in November, and that hasn't changed. And I think there is a paradigm shift here. And if I'm wrong, I'll come out and say that I'm wrong. But quite frankly, I don't think I'm going to be. Yeah, so today's interesting. You see emerging markets are getting nailed. We know that the Russian market, I don't even know how big it is, was down like 45% at one point today. So emerging markets have obviously bear the brunt of a lot of this pain. But in the U.S. market, look at staples getting murdered today, consumer staples, even oil stocks. You've had a great call on oil services, but the OIH is down about 1%. Schlumberger is down more than 4%. The major integrated names, Exxon, down a couple percent. So I think that's interesting that crude's holding on. I know that the administration talked about tapping strategic petroleum reserve and maybe that's the sort of thing that you see things chill out i think you got to go back to late november into december guy when the last time that the administration did that because oil prices were getting high and had nothing to do with what was going on at the time with russia we saw a 25 percent peak to drop decline that could be in the cards any thoughts on the energy space here or any thoughts on some of these sectors that are not doing well financials energy stocks and staples today i don't think the energy move is over by any stretch, but we had Paul Sankey on Fast Money earlier this week, and he talked about the potential for a very tactical short-term 
short trade in energy. He, he called it the a, hero trade guy. He, he called, called it the, the hero, hero trade. trade. And maybe yeah. it was a day early in retrospect, but he was spot on if you really think about it. And today, I think, was the exact type of day that he was looking for. We traded WTI once again, traded with a $100 handle today. And obviously, the sell-off was remarkable in a word. Commodities move. They don't typically move like that, especially one as big as crude oil. Again, I'll say it. I don't think the energy move is over. I think it's probably stalled for the next week, week and a half. And we've seen this before. You've pointed it out before. The peak to trough declines in energy along the way have been staggering. Now, you mentioned OIH. I think that's really important. The OIH comprised mainly of Schlumberger, Halliburton, and to a lesser extent, Baker Hughes has been in this, again, very well-defined range. 175 on the downside, 240, 245 on the upside. Well, that downside was tested and thwarted, and now this upside is being tested and seemingly failing at. And we're probably going to trade back down to 220, 225, which I think will be another buying opportunity. The point is this, and you say it all the time, nothing goes straight up and nothing goes straight down. I think the energy move is still intact. I think we're taking a breather here. But the risks associated with crude oil have been, in many ways, Dan, fundamental in nature, supply-demand in nature, and that doesn't abate overnight. Well, it is interesting, right? So money's coming out of some of those names right now, and we were just talking about this massive squeeze, and I'm looking at my fact set board here with hundreds of stocks on it, and I see dozens that are up at least 5%. I see probably a few dozen that are up at least 10% right now. So money's coming out of banks, coming out of staples, coming out of energy. Those have been areas that have shown relative outperformance until really recently. But you just said that things don't go straight down. Here's a stock that I think is really important to talk about. We've talked Talked about it, I think, on the tape before. And I'm not going to get into the fundamentals, but with Shopify, this stock traded at an all time high of 1763. This was in mid November. And today, guy, at its lows, it traded 585. So that is going lower in a straight line. Now, here's the important thing right now, the stock is up about 6%. Okay. It's about $35. But that 6%, it could be up 12%. It looks like a blip on that chart. And I think that's what I want to implore some of our listeners to do as they're thinking about, are we there yet? Listen, a stock like Shopify that's down 65% could go down another 25% from 660 to 500. And that could be a widow maker for you right now. So the way you think about picking at some of these really good secular stories that just got way overdone to the upside, they may get way over overdone to the downside. And I think that's a really important point. If you have cash, I think it makes sense to start maybe dipping your toe in some of these things. But guy, give us some rules of thumb a little bit, because we get a lot of people who ask us all the time, down 60%, how can I lose? Well, it really comes down to your time horizon. It also comes down to risk management. You've mentioned this numerous times. I think people have very short memories. Amazon, we all know what Amazon is. It had a 90% peak to trough decline in its early years. That is a staggering move. So everybody thinks by definition it's over. Well, at a certain point it is. I don't think we're there yet. And to your point about these exaggerated then subsequent moves to the upside, DraftKings is now a $20 stock. This stock was north of $70. It could have a 50% move, go from 20 to 30 and still be in a significant downtrend. But you've seen these counter trend moves. So I think it's really important. The other name we have to mention, because if we didn't, Danny would hate us, and it's in the news and it's topical. Tesla today, again, today being Thursday, traded $700 on the screws. We had a subsequent bounce, but it's more than just a stock, Dan. Tesla's in the news now for the wrong reason. Seemingly, the Musk brothers are under some sort of investigation. The Wall Street Journal had a pretty short article out about it. And I think if you look at over the last couple of weeks or so, Elon has been trolling the SEC. It seems like he's always trolling the SEC. We do recall a couple of years ago, he had a settlement with the SEC about disclosures that he was making. I think he was meant to be off Twitter as part of that. This guy, I think he's a bit unhinged here. And I mean that sincerely. We were talking about how he was comparing the Prime Minister of Canada last week on Twitter with memes to Hitler. And it's just not cool. I used to give the guy a lot of credit because the company went public in 2010 and it was a very controversial stock then and it continued to be a very controversial stock for years and years and years and it wasn't until during the pandemic where the stock really started to take off and in two different instances and this is well documented he had handshake deals to sell the company because he couldn't make payroll i read that 
in a biography by Ashley Vance that he participated in. And that was, I think, back in 2016, selling the company to the Google guys. At the end of the day, this story is not done. The stock, having nothing to do with him, got divorced from reality of all of the competition coming. But more importantly, when that stock was trading above 1100 I think it traded as high as 1275 or something, he announced that he was going to start selling stock. He actually took a Twitter poll saying, hey, people, should I sell some stock so I can pay some taxes? And I think it had something to do with getting Elizabeth Warren off his back because the claim was that he never paid any taxes. And he did pay a lot of taxes and all the power to him. But at the time, I remember you and I talking about it and Danny and saying, man, how is this guy going to sell $10 billion worth of stock and the company's not going to sell anything? And he used to buy on every deal, every secondary that they did and every convert they did. And I used to give him a ton of credit for that. And he became like a 25% shareholder of the stock. I just thought it was really goofy that the company with the stock way inflated, didn't sell any stock and make no mistake about it from a sentiment standpoint, when he started selling stock and he did it in waves of billions of dollars, that was it, guy. That was the top. So obviously the last couple of weeks, I use the word historic, but it's true. The volatility is unbelievable what we've seen in some individual names. But I want to point this out because people say this to me all the time. I wish certain stocks or I wish the market sold off so I'd be able to buy things that I missed or get into the market that maybe got ahead of it. And then these sell-offs happen and people become paralyzed. Why? Because they typically happen, these sell-offs, for reasons that they didn't see coming and reasons which might find them be a little bit scary. And then again, they become paralyzed. Try to take emotion out of it, Dan. That's something you've said for a while. And I think you'll be a much better investor and trader. The other thing I want to mention, because it's important, in terms of valuation, you talk about an S&P 500 that had been trading for months, if not longer, anywhere between 23 and 24 times next year's earnings. Well, that's come back down to some semblance of reality somewhere around 18 and a half times. Now, still probably historically rich, but at least we're back to some semblance of normalcy. Not to suggest they can't go lower and valuations can't go a little bit lower from here, but at least valuation is not a big a concern as it was months ago. No doubt about it. I mean, on many single stock names, we just mentioned PayPal earlier. When that stock was trading above 300, it was trading at multiple sales that many people would have thought was expensive. It was a PE. And so right now, the stock traded as low as 90 this morning. It closed, I think, around 105 here on Thursday afternoon. And what's really interesting, keep an eye on the estimates. So estimates were kind of overshooting when the stock was near its highs. Analysts are tripping over each other, raised their estimates to justify their stock prices. Well, now, Earnings per share is expected to be flat in the current year in 2022, expected to rise at least 20% next year on 20% sales. And to Guy's point about the S&P multiple, this stock on a Ford multiple is below the S&P 500. So that's the sort of work you should be doing in periods like that. That looks really interesting to me. I would say for the here and now, for people who want to deploy capital, I'm with Guy. I think it makes sense to be defensive here. I know that there's a level where you would buy energy stock if they came in really hard on some sort of easing of tensions in the near term, I would look at things like the XLP, which is the consumer staple sector. It just got absolutely nailed here. I think that there's a level not too far from where it's trading, maybe between 70 and 72. That would make some sense. I would also look at large cap pharma, the XLV. That looks really interesting to me, somewhere between 120 and 125. So if you're looking to put money to work in broad sectors, I think in fast markets like this, that makes sense. The last thing I'm going to say is also the QQQ. And we've been talking about this. Five or six stocks make up 40 to 50% of the weight of that thing. If we see Apple at one point, it was trading, I think 151 this morning, it closed at 162 and a half. If you see Microsoft, if you see Google, some of these relative strength winners, if they do get sold off, if they go through today's lows and we get a capitulatory thing, then you want to buy the QQQ. You lose all the idiosyncratic risk of those big names. And then you also get the benefit of the dozens of stocks in this NASDAQ 100 that are down at least 50%. That's the way I'd be playing it. When there's blood in the streets and you want to be greedy when others are fearful, I think you go to the QQQ guy. Now, I know our crack producer, Amanda Diaz, was questioning this, these uh -oh. aping into we something. Got, or, But Amanda, we, jump in we gotta here, We've got to talk please. about, we can't let this week go by without talking about Dan's dick butt. Diaz, come on. This is a family show here. 
All right, so I tweeted this out the other day because I saw our good friend Meltem Demuras from CoinShare. She does OK Computer with me. That's one of our other podcasts here on Risk Reversal. Check it out in the podcast stores, people. But we had a great conversation on macro this week. And then as I was doing my research for that episode, I looked at her Twitter and I saw that she had bought a couple PFP. Those are profile pick guys, NFTs, non-fungible tokens of crypto dick butts. And they're these cute little guys. And I said to her, I had a couple NFTs. I had three of this one. I'm not going to say what it was. And somebody offered me something for it, which just seemed ridiculous considering that I didn't pay a whole heck of a lot for it just a few months ago. So I hit a bid on one of the three and then I had these E's sticking around here and I looked at her dick butts and I was like, God, I got to have one of those. So I aped into one of those guys. I made it my profile pick for a day. And then what happened? Crypto crashed. So I had to change it back out. I felt bad for the whole crypto community. I'm hodling the crypto dick butt but I'm still kind of apprehensive to having it as my Twitter avatar right now. Yeah, for good reason. By the way, the last three minutes and 47 seconds or three <laughs> minutes and 47 seconds of my life, I will never get back <laughs> because I didn't understand a word you just said. And thank you, Amanda, for taking me down that road. Now, Dan, as you know, typically in the beginning of the show, I will tease our guest. I chose not to do that today because the guy we have coming on, I think you all want to listen to. When we come back, Joe DeSena from the Spartan Race. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of the standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in crypto, precious metals, FX, energy, and equity indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash micros. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about Current? You're going to like this, guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a new Current customer, and I manage all of my finances from one easy-to-use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to Current.com slash tape and download the app. That's Current.com slash tape. Current is a financial technology company not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra-rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called Masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on Masterworks.io. Just go to Masterworks.art slash tape. That's masterworks.art slash tape. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Taboola uses AI to power recommendations for many of the world's top publishers and cell phone manufacturers. You know Taboola if you ever went to websites like CNBC or USA Today. When you finish reading an article, it's that tricked out recommendation engine pointing you towards additional content you will like. They also help brands reach over 500 million daily users, which makes them a compelling alternative to Facebook and Google ad platforms. Taboola has long-term exclusive partnerships with publishers, which means they help people like you and me discover content outside of social media. Taboola is a founder-led company that is traded as TBLA on the NASDAQ. Find out more about their mission at taboola.com. Joe DeSena is the founder and CEO of Spartan. He is also a New York Times bestselling author of Spartan Up, Spartan Fit, and The Spartan Way. His fourth book, 10 Rules for Resilience, Mental Toughness for Families, will hit bookstores in October. Prior to founding the sports and wellness brand, DeSena had a successful career on Wall Street. He also created a multi-million dollar pool and construction business while in college. Joe's racing resume is nothing short of amazing, completing 14 Ironman events in one year alone and 50 ultra events overall. His new CNBC primetime series, No Retreat Business Boot Camp, premieres on March 8th. Joe, welcome to On the Tape. 
So you heard me read Joe's bio. I met Joe a decade or so ago, and I'm saying to myself, this guy is a total badass. Now, I throw that around every once in a while, but in the case of Joe DeSena, it's absolutely true. And it's a real pleasure to have you on with us, Joe. Talk to me quickly about how you got to this point. Your childhood is fascinating. At some point, they're going to make a movie about you, your family, and everything you've been through over the years. Can you just give us a little taste of what it was like growing up Joe DeSena? Thanks for having me. And I was feeling down today. I was actually broken for about 12 seconds, but you just gave me a shot in the arm. I'm feeling pretty good about myself right now. So I needed that. I grew up in Queens, Howard Beach, for whatever reason, organized crime capital of the world. Four of the five family bosses lived there and all their associates. And it was a place that just hustled. They woke up at 5 a.m. The bagels were being buttered. The coffee was being brewed. The trucks were rumbling in and out of JFK, whether the stuff was coming in legal or not, there was just action. And so me and the kids in that neighborhood, we just learned how to get it done. And I learned some really great lessons. I started a business at a young age there. I had no intention of ever getting to Wall Street. That was just way too far of a stretch coming from Queens. And somehow, luck would have it, I ended up on Wall Street. Not only did I end up on Wall Street, but I ended up in the right place because back in the late 80s and the 90s, you could end up doing retail. And if you did retail, you might end up in a firm that was not doing the right thing by its customers. And a lot of people got in trouble. And thankfully, I made a lot less money, but I ended up on an institutional desk. And I ended up covering all the banks, all the big hedge funds, the mutual funds we all know, learned that business, and then had said to myself, God, I don't want to sit at a desk. That is one thing I don't want to do. I don't want to be typing all day and just sitting. I need to move. I want action. I want to make some money and get the hell out of here. And I had an opportunity in 2000 to buy a farm in Vermont. I met my wife and convinced her we were getting a farm in Vermont, some goats, chickens. We were going to make babies. And we ended up in Vermont. It's an amazing story, and I'm not looking to bury the lead here, but you also have a CNBC show coming up called No Retreat, which is just a perfect name for the show. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but in terms of you, do you think you can learn that kind of discipline, or is that part of your DNA? A lot of people want to be Joe DeSena. A lot of people want to get their ass out of the chair and do half of the things, a quarter of the things that you've done. They just can't do it. A couple of things on that. One is, when I was very young and I was running my first business in Queens, My first customer was head of a banana organized crime family. I was cleaning his swimming pool. He was teaching me some business lessons. On time is late. Go above and beyond. If I'm paying you to clean the pool, I also want you to straighten up the lawn furniture in the shed. And then the final one, which is really bizarre, was don't ask for money. You provide value, you get paid. And the reason I bring it up is I was having a really tough time satisfying those customers. They demanded excellence. And I didn't know what would happen (laughs) if I screwed up. And I ended up hiring some kids from the neighborhood and they didn't last very long. They didn't have the discipline. But then I hired a couple of kids that just arrived from Poland. They were immigrants. They were fighting for milk. I couldn't outwork these guys. It was my business. They worked for me. I could not keep up with them. I pretended to. I pretended to wake up before them and stay later. But these guys just wanted more hours. And I quickly learned that we learn helplessness. We are inherently all lazy, but if you're forced, if you have to fight to survive, then it comes out. So deep down inside, we have that discipline. We have that commitment. We could be the best versions of ourselves, but we don't because we don't have to. We live in a great country with abundance. Well, let me ask you a follow-up there because they've done studies about this. You mentioned the Polish guys you brought in and how they completely outworked you and kicked your ass because they were hungry. They say it takes about three generations or thereabout to knock that shit out of you until you become like the rest of us. Do you adhere to that? Is there some truth to that? Or do you think that's just complete bullshit? There's no doubt about it. I mean, even when I think back to the neighborhood and there were these guys that had these giant houses, they had succeeded. They muscled. I won't even say hustled. They muscled their way to the top. Why were their kids soft? That was a question that just kept being repeated in my head. Why were these two Polish guys next to me working so hard? They had nothing. They weren't educated any better. They didn't come from these great houses with these tough dads. Why were the kids soft? So I don't even know if it takes three generations. Yes, I adhere to that. I'm fighting tooth and nail to make sure my kids 
And by the way, it's not like we live super lavishly or anything. They grew up on a farm. I made my kids walk to the top of the mountain to get their Christmas presents. Like I purposely throw obstacles in front of them, but it's still easy. So yes, I adhere to that. And I think it's our biggest downfall. And I think the worst thing we could do for our kids is make a lot of money. Well, Guy and I don't have that problem, Joe. You and I met, I want to say, right after the financial crisis, and you had a business that was doing very well on Wall Street. It was an inter-dealer business, and you just mentioned that you were very fortunate to get into the institutional side of it. And in hindsight, there was never a better time to be an inter-dealer broker in the aftermath of the financial crisis because business was brisk. And to do really well at that job, you need to have discipline. And you're serving actually multiple bosses, which brings me back to your upbringing in in Queens, when you never asked for money, you did a job and you got paid. And I always knew that you had a really great relationship on the street. And there was a lot of really important traders that really trusted you. Talk to us a little bit about that experience. I did that job for a while. It's a hard job. You have to make a lot of people happy. You have to be precise. You have to be Johnny on the spot. To me, discipline is really a big part of that, but it's also a sales job too, right? People have to like you and want to do business with you too. Well, at the end of the day, I think every job, people have to like you. I think about our children at home, what are some attributes we could teach them that'll really make the difference? You gotta be likable, you gotta be able to communicate well. Certainly on the job you're talking about on Wall Street, especially where the stakes are high, you gotta be liked and people have to wanna spend time with you and you can't waste their time and you gotta deliver what you say you're gonna deliver. And so, yes, it's complicated, yes, it's hard, not everybody could do it, but reflecting back, it's not that hard. It's not like we were digging trenches, <laughs> you know? It's not like we were in Poland. So I was lucky, again, go back to the neighborhood. You learn to take people to dinner. Even if you only had $100 in your pocket, it was your last $100, you paid for dinner. That was the thing you did. You got a table at the best restaurant. You didn't waste people's time. You always showed up a little early. So as long as I did that, we did business and we did a lot of business. And as a matter of fact, you're gonna love this. I don't know if this is ever talked about, there was a moment in time as I was building that business on Wall Street coming out of 9-11 where finally I was able to hire folks from the big banks. I could hire a guy from Goldman. I could hire a guy from Merrill and Morgan. I couldn't get those people beforehand. They didn't want to work for a small firm. And by the way, when I say guy, it's a guy or a woman. Got a guy is a thing from the neighborhood. But I finally could hire these people. And I got to tell you, they didn't do so well. They did well at their jobs because the phones rang at those big banks. At our firm, you had to make the phone ring. So the people on our desk that killed it, that were like the Polish in my previous business, they were kids from the neighborhood. I grew up on the buy side of the business. And when I was in the inner dealer business, I actually sat around for a couple months. I was just gone from Merrill. And at a certain point, the guy I was working with who had been my broker prior said to me, dude, you gotta ask for it. So this is one of the reasons why when you just said, don't ask for the work, if you don't ask, they're not going to do the business and then you have to prove yourself. So I thought that's a really, really interesting point. What was it about the business at the time in the aftermath of the financial crisis that led you to want to leave it? Let's go back in time. In the mid nineties, when I got into it, I remember a bunch of people on the over the counter desk saying, oh, you're getting in the business too late. We used to make 40, 50 cents, sometimes a dollar a share commissions. You're getting in now, you get six cents, it's a waste of time. You might wanna consider a different career. Well, I took commissions at two cents and we killed it. And when I was getting out, I thought, well, it's over. To your point, it wasn't over. I just didn't wanna sit on the desk. I had a picture of a red barn on my desk. I said, I'm just making enough money to be able to pay my bills, have a healthy life, raise some kids and some goats. I'm heading for the hills. I didn't realize that you might outlive your money, so you got to keep making money, unfortunately. You got to keep grinding. And in terms of keep grinding, let's go back to Cornell, because unless my math is off, I think before they accepted you, you applied there four or five different times. And I think they finally said, who is this kid, Joe DeSena? Just to shut him up, we got to let him in. And hopefully he's out of here in a semester. How does that even happen? I had no intention of going to college. I didn't know what Cornell was. It might as well have been a yogurt. The neighborhood I came from and my family didn't introduce me to any of that. But my parents got divorced. My mother moved us to Ithaca, New York. There's a couple of big colleges there, Ithaca College, Cornell University. And as I was graduating high school, a friend of mine said, listen, why don't we go to Cornell? And I said, well, go to Cornell. My SAT scores are terrible. I didn't do well in school. And I got this swimming pool cleaning and construction business back in Queens. I got to go back to the neighborhood. He said, listen, my dad's a professor. He's going to get us in. 
And it made sense to me coming from the neighborhood. If you got somebody to get you in a restaurant or whatever, I got somebody to get me in college. And so we go on interviews and we crush the interviews. And my dad can't stop bragging about how his son went on an interview. All it was, was all I had to do was stop right there. If just the interview, I was a big deal in the neighborhood. And neither of us got accepted. Not the professor's son, nor myself. So I was intrigued now. The fact that I couldn't do this got me excited that, wait a minute, who were they to say, I can't do this? So my friend said, listen, we could go extramural. We could take up to three classes while the matriculated students, the kids that get in the natural way, take five classes, 15 credits. We could do three classes, nine credits. And if we do well, my dad says, the professor says, they'll have a tough time denying us. So why don't we do that in the fall? So I said, well, if we're going to do that, I'll go back to Queens. I'll run my business. I'll go to St. John's. I'll take a couple of classes at St. John's University in Queens. He says, why would we do that? He says, why don't we party all summer? We'll go to Vegas, and then we'll buckle down in September. That was really the beginning for me of understanding this idea of delayed gratification, discipline, and focus, because I made the decision to go to Queens, run my business, take a couple of classes at St. John's, fell in love with the idea of studying, which I was doing for the first time in my life. I looked like, remember Alex Keaton from Family Ties? I had a suit on and suspended. I was cleaning pools during, I was running to class. And then we went to Cornell. We took our three classes. I worked my ass off and got two A's and a B, which for me might as well have been like getting accepted to work for Tesla along Elon Musk. Like it was a big deal for me. And we reapplied and neither of us got accepted. And they said, listen, we can't have people coming in the back door if you want to come here, you're going to have to go to another school, reapply in a couple of years. And so my friend tapped out. Again, we'll go back to that level of commitment, discipline, resilience. My friend tapped out and he said, you know what? I had such a good time in Vegas during the summer. I'm going to UNLV. And he took off. And I said, well, I'm going to give it another go. I'm going to take another semester. So I did another three classes, reapplied, denied. And then I thought, well, I'm going to break them before they break me, right? I'm going to do another semester. I did another semester. I think by the fourth semester, they broke me. And my business was doing much better in New York. And I thought, you know what? College is not for me. Clearly, they're not going to accept me. Talked to my mom. Talked to my dad. I said, I'm going to New York, mom. I'll see you. She said, well, before you go, because no mother wants to see their son leave. And she said, I teach yoga to this woman. That She's something at Cornell. I don't know what she does. But she's willing to have lunch with you. Why don't you go meet her before you pack it in? So I sat down with Professor Anita Racine. I'll never forget her name. She sat me down. She said, oh, I see your transcripts. I see you've done pretty well. You're applying to Cornell. Do you like textiles? And I didn't really know what a textile was. She said, because there's 92 women in our department, and there's no men, and we want some diversity, and we're looking for men to join the department. I said, I love textiles. And so, and so I was accepted into Cornell, and I studied textiles. That's how I got in. Perseverance, though, it speaks to that. You said something about your kids that I just find fascinating, how you and your wife, you're raising them the way you want to raise them, which I think is great. But obviously, your kids have friends. What's the dynamic there? Do you get calls from parents saying, look, I don't know what you guys got going on in that house, but Joey can't keep up with your daughter. How does that dynamic work? I'm going to sound like a crazy person. Nobody's going to ever want to watch the show when they hear this. But if you want to go down that rabbit hole... My wife and I buy the farm in Vermont. We're living on the farm. We start having kids. And I'm watching Kill Bill. And I'm watching Uma Thurman train with a kung fu master in Kill Bill. And I'm thinking, we need a kung fu master. We got to find a kung fu master to live on the farm with us and train the kids. Wouldn't it be unbelievable? I wish I had a kung fu master growing up. So my wife went along with it because she figured there's no way. How is he going to get a kung fu master to move to Vermont? True story. I called... Danny's Szechuan Garden was in Howard Beach, Queens. It was a Chinese restaurant. Aside from the 20 pizza places and Italian food, there was one Chinese restaurant. I called Danny. I said, Danny's going to sound crazy. I need a Kung Fu master up in Vermont. I know I haven't spoken to you in 15 years. He got me a Kung Fu master. We flew a Kung Fu master in from China, moved to Vermont, and every day, two a day, seven days a week, the kids trained in Kung Fu. If there was bad weather outside, I would make the kids carry stuff through the bad weather outside. Like my wife said, this is crazy. There's a hurricane. I said, the kids have to learn to be tough, to be resilient, to not be those soft kids we spoke about earlier here. I have to manufacture this adversity and they're not going to get killed out there. We're keeping an eye on them through the window. They're going to be able to do this. We just made it tougher and tougher and tougher. So much so 
that Jack, my oldest, when he was eight, ran the Boston Marathon. Charlie ran the New York Marathon when he was seven. Catherine ran a Spartan Beast in Indonesia when she was six. And Alex, the little one, she's a beast. She's unbelievable. It's really amazing. And I'm sure they talk amongst themselves. There got to be times they're saying, dad's out of his effing mind. How does that work? You guys eating dinner together? Listen, I wish I raised my kids that way. For me, it was just lazy. It takes perseverance. You have to be diligent about it. And for me, it would have been really difficult to do. You also need support to do it as well, which you had. But what are those conversations like at the dinner table? First of all, anybody listening that has an inkling of jealousy about it, I will tell you, it's almost impossible to do. It creates tremendous friction between you and your spouse and every neighbor and every family member. The only reason I was able to get away with the Kung Fu Master in Vermont was because we had a barn that was 100 feet away from the house. So every morning the kids would go in there and it would be absolute torture, but nobody heard it. Nobody saw them working out and sweating and screaming and all that. So it's hard. The world wants to give kids lollipops and cookies and no one really understands. I've been stopped a thousand times by people asking the kids if they're okay. And I'm like, I'm the dad, why don't you ask me? Kids, is he a coach, are you okay? Why are you carrying that kettlebell? I've seen you walking for the last two hours on the street. So it's hard and you gotta have buy-in. I found out recently, my buddy owns Saks Fifth Avenue. I had to run on a business trip and he came out and saw my family. And he's like, I gotta tell you, when you're not there, your wife's getting them ice cream, having fun. So there is definitely a balance that happens when I'm not there. I love that. So let's talk about the Spartan race because clearly there was a gap that needed to be filled in the form of the Spartan race. And you probably had this idea in your head brewing for a long time. I will tell you, I'm sort of a psycho as well. And the thought about attempting to do a death race fascinates me. And one of these days, maybe I'll give it a shot just to see what the hell happens. But talk about the genesis of Spartan Race. So my dad used to say, when I started that business at a young age, an entrepreneur has to have the stomach for it. And I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I was going through hell and back trying to start that business and run that business. I mean, most businesses fail within the first five years. 95% of businesses get knocked out. So you got to have the stomach for it, like my dad said. And then I got into racing. It was a way for me to calm down and have some semblance of sanity around all the craziness on Wall Street and building a family. I would do all these races. I was at an Ironman in Lake Placid, and it was pouring rain. I mean, ridiculous rain, the kind you read about, biblical. And I saw a bunch of people quit. And I thought, hang on a second. It doesn't say Ironman unless it's raining. It says Ironman. And so it drove me nuts. And on my way back to Vermont from Lake Placid, I said, you know what? I got to create a race that emulates life, that emulates business. Everything that can go wrong does go wrong. It rains, no big deal. You get out of the swim and you get on your bike, but your bike seat is missing. And now you got to bike over 100 miles without a bike seat, but you have to do it. And so I created the death race to push people like yourself. We all want to be a Marine for a day. We all want to be in the Olympics for a day. This was a chance to not focus on saving four ounces on your bike seat and spending $500 because you could, but focus on the fact that everything is going wrong. You're crying, you're broken, you know you shouldn't be there, but somehow you muster up enough energy to finish anyway. And when you can do that, when you can get through it, you're ready for anything. And that was the genesis, that's how it started. I think people will be surprised what they're capable of doing. I'm proud of a few things, I'm proud of my family. Outside of that, personal accomplishments, not so much. But I will tell you, in 2012, I finished the first ever and only New York City Ironman. Now, I wasn't doing any speed records. I finished it in 16 hours and 19 minutes. But to your point, I saw people that were in much better shape than I was tapping out because maybe they got a flat tire, things weren't going well on the run. And I'm like, F that, man. And I know this sounds crazy, but I'm telling you the truth. They were either going to carry me off in a bag or I was going to finish that race. And... My point, I guess, is, and I think you've probably learned this, people don't know what they're capable of doing it until they try. Yeah, you know what I used to do for training, and it goes right to that point, is I would have my wife drop me off 40 miles away. No money, no phone, got to get home. And so I say to people, I could never do that. I could never do the New York Ironman, like you said. I could never do a Spartan. Listen, God forbid we were in a car crash. God forbid we had no money. 
What happened 100 years ago? We're going out west with a horse and carriage. Grandma died along the way. The wooden wheel broke. Your wife gave birth, but somehow you made it to California. Yeah, some people died, but those people that made it are the people we're talking about, the ones that muster up the energy and got it done. You make that choice, in my opinion. Deep down inside, we're all pretty resilient creatures. We can all get it done. Everybody could do that 16 hours and 19 minutes, not to take away anything you did or I did. They just have to choose to do it. You just got to do it, one foot in front of the other, and get it done. Joe, it's interesting. Guy and I really didn't get to know each other. I started doing Fast Money with him probably about 2011. And in 2012, all of a sudden, he starts showing up, eating fruit in the green room, and just had a different shine to him a little bit, or kicking his step. And he starts telling us that he's training for an Ironman. I'm like, what? He was in late 40s. You're as old as I am now. I'm 49 years old. And I'm like, why would you do an Ironman? You haven't even run a marathon. I don't even know if you know how to swim. And you set out and you methodically did it. And you had a mission also. I think you were doing it for the New Jersey Leukemia Society guy. And you were leading up a team and everything like that. And I was just so amazed. And there was an article in the Times about him. And he did it. And to your point, Joe, it's cares what the time is. You did it. You got yourself over all three of those finish lines and you did it. And I just gained so much respect for him. And it was really the start of a friendship that unfortunately is not mutual. I've never done anything like that. At this age, do you still enjoy it? And do you get hurt? And do you fear injury? Well, a couple of things. My mom and dad are both dead. Mom died in her 40s of cancer. Dad died of heart disease, diabetes. I don't know if we could have beat what my mom had. Maybe that was environmental. Maybe it was lifestyle, whatever. But dad certainly was lifestyle. Knock on wood, today I've outlived them both. And one thing that's driven me crazy is how could you be really successful in business? How could you be really successful in family and parts of your life and then not be successful around the health and wellness you can control? And I'm a believer, we go back to the Polish story earlier, I'm a believer that we're all inherently lazy. Our brains are designed that way. Our brains are designed to not have us do any extra effort. So our brains are telling us not to do anything, to be healthy, You've got to go out and do stuff. And so, yes, I put dates on the calendar. I still do it now because when you do that, when you say, I got a race this weekend in Florida, when you have a date on the calendar, it forces you to fight your brain, wake up early, and do the work. Guy, you know it. When you had that race on the calendar, you put down the cookie. You got up a little earlier. You sweat every day. So, yeah, I put dates on the calendar and I do it. And as far as injury goes, I believe in yoga. I believe in stretching. I believe in taking care of your body. I was at the Indy 500 last weekend and those cars come in for pit stops. You got to treat your body like a car. You got to take care of it. There are people listening to this saying, well, I'm never going to be Joe DeSena, but there's ways to do this just to start. And one of the things we did as kids, which sucked, one of the things you probably do hundreds of times a day is burpees. And I think you would submit if you do nothing else in life, if you just start doing burpees, you're not going to be Jack LaLanne, but you're going to get pretty damn close. The burpee is so amazing. Burpees and walking. Another one, here's a simple one if you did nothing else. Every chance you get, whether you're in an airport, you're going to your apartment, your house, take the stairs. Don't take the escalators. Don't take the elevator. I go to big fitness conventions. There's an escalator and there's stairs. All the fitness people are taking the escalator. Are you kidding me? Just take the stairs. That alone would change your game. But yes, burpees. Yes, walk. Park your car an extra five blocks from the grocery store. Figure that out. I love that. Let's talk about your show, No Retreat. It's going to air on CNBC. I'm fired up about it. This is not causality. I'm not suggesting that. But I had talked to CNBC years ago. I'm like, you got to meet this guy. You got to meet this guy. And finally, it's coming to fruition. Talked about, again, to use the word genesis of the show and what we should expect. I've been pitching TV for as long as you and I know each other. We had a couple of shows on TV that were related to Spartan. This was one show I was not pitching. I've taken every meeting. I've gone to every network. And somehow I ended up in the CEO of CNBC's office. I carried my kettlebell in. I put it on his desk and we sat down for about 10 minutes. And it was pre-COVID. And I said, look, I think businesses need a kick in the ass. The reason they're failing is not because they're bad ideas, not because they're bad people. They get complacent and they trip over themselves. And maybe they read Harvard Business Review. Maybe they listen to a podcast, but it's not enough. Actually have to do the work. He bought in. We were filming the show and COVID hit and took a pause. I thought it was dead. We came out of COVID and he said, we're back on. And I literally filmed for like 60 days. 
You guys know better than me what it's all about. And the show's awesome. We've been going back and checking in with the companies that we had on the farm. We absolutely kill these guys. We kill them. Well, first things first, we do not know what it's like. Your TV show is a little different than Guy and me sitting our asses on a set in the NASDAQ talking about NVIDIA and Apple and Amazon for an hour. Guy, I'm feeling like there should be some sort of no retreat, fast money collab. Could we get the crew out there up on his farm or what? I'd absolutely love to do that. And I'm not a huge podcast person, although you happen to be on ours right now. But Leif Babin and Jocko Wilnick, I don't know if you're familiar with those guys, Joe, but they're of that same mindset. And I got to tell you something, the success speaks for itself. So I don't know if you can share any stories, success stories. I don't know what's embargoed, what's not, but I'm sure there've been some great stories coming on the back of this. So the idea basically is I go in to the company ascertain with my team, what are the three main issues the company's dealing with? Every company, including my own, has issues. And we bring those issues and the team up to the farm into what they think is a retreat, because that's what most companies do. That's what we all want to do. And it is no retreat. It is hardcore entering the armed services for two or three days. And we really highlight those issues we found. We work through those issues and they become better for it. We then check in with them three months later, and this is gonna sound strange for me, but I am shocked at the feedback we have gotten regarding how effective the farm was. I didn't think it was gonna be that positive of an impact, and it's been incredible. It's gonna be interesting to see how long it lasts before people revert back into the shitty habits most of us have. To me, that's gonna be really interesting. Obviously, you can't answer that now, but I know you're thinking about it. I had mentioned to CNBC, we need a couple of black vans where every eight or nine months when people start to get complacent, the van shows up in the middle of the night, we rip them out of their houses, bring them back to the farm for a quick update, and then send them back to their businesses. So I agree with you. Well, Joe, for me, this is a treat having you on, and I can speak for Dan. We appreciate you taking the time. No Retreat airs Tuesday, March 8th on CNBC. I absolutely will be watching it. And Joe, if somehow you can get CNBC to do a Fast Money No Retreat collab, I am 100% all in. I think we should plan on having a Fast Money death race as a precursor. I'm in, because I don't give a fuck. I will do it. I'm one of these assholes. You'll be literally pulling me out of that pond looking for my bike chain to put on the bike at the other end of the pond. I love all this stuff. So thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks for having me. You guys are awesome. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 